Welcome, everybody. As you know, my guest today is Sophia Swire, and we're going to really talk about her life, what drove her to do the work that she's doing today, which is having a huge impact in uh, what's called MENA, uh, Middle East and North Africa, and also about the work that she's uh, done in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So without further ado, uh, hello, Sophia. Hello, Jim. What an honor to be included and invited on your podcast. Well, you're always such a polite and so sweet. I appreciate that. And for our listeners who may not know, uh, actually, Sophia and I have known each other for well over a decade, probably two, I think. Um, and I've followed her work with great admiration. And uh, it's very difficult, I think, uh, when you're working in those parts of the world uh, as a woman. And uh, hopefully, Sophia will talk about that as well. But let's start um, with sort of the motivators and drivers of how you got here today. What, what stimulated, motivated you, inspired you as a child? Well, um, I'm quite sure we're, we're all deeply formed by our early childhood experiences. As the Jesuits say, give me a child from naught to seven and I'll have him for life. So uh, there's no question that I was uh, formed by uh, my family, which comes from a traditional Scottish English um, sort of background. My uh, father's family um, are uh, come from an old line of, of, of I suppose, uh, traders from, from the Middle East and the Far East, from Hong Kong. Um, and my mother's family is an old landed family from Scotland. Um, and so I, I had a very traditional upbringing. I, I was sent to boarding school at a very young age. Um, and uh, boarding school in Britain is designed to, to make uh, sort of robust and resilient colonialists out of people. So you, you learn to live apart from, from family for a long time at a very sort of young age. I, I think I was sent off to, to boarding school at the age of 10. My brothers were sent off at the age of six and seven. So those are deeply formative experiences. Um, and then we, we also traveled a lot. So we were never in one place for more than a few years. I, I was born and, and brought up, um, I guess, in, partly in London, partly in Oxfordshire. Uh, but we also spent a couple of years in Spain when I was very young. Uh, a few years in Scotland, a few years in Dorset, and we, we never really settled. So we had a very peripatetic childhood, um, in, in a way quite uh, traditional and in, in other ways not. My, my parents were quite privileged, you know, um, this was the 60s and 70s, and um, they, they, were, they, they enjoyed themselves, they, they, uh, they had a good life, um, and um, we were brought up to be very adventurous, um, to be uh, quite sort of outward looking, quite international, because the English can be quite insular, but we were brought up in a very international, um, outward looking way, you can say. And then the very first uh, thing I did as, as a sort of, as a, as a teenager that might be considered adult was volunteer for a, an Afghan aid um, event in London. This was the, must have been about 1980, so right at the beginning of the Soviet uh, uh, invasion occupation. and occupation of Afghanistan, um, and Afghan Aid was a very prominent British charity that was uh, working with Masood, the Lion of the Panjshir. Um And I, I was invited to this uh, event, and I got to meet some of the Mujahideen commanders who turned up on their um, stumps, their wooden stumps, because this was before the era of prosthetics. And the Russians, the Soviets were already um, using uh, landmines as a weapon of war. So these very proud, very handsome, very articulate um, Mujahideen commanders um, arrived and they were on pedestals on wooden stumps without, without an ounce of self-pity. <clears throat> and they were speaking to the audience, which consisted of, of the lords and ladies of the land and, and much of the cabinet, very senior people. And they were, they were without any kind of shyness or um, any kind of self-consciousness. They, they were powerful, uh, 
very articulate beings and and very handsome and and very stylish. They wore these um, uh, shawls around their their uh, necks, a little bit like this, same sort of color, same sort of natural color, just swooped around their shoulders with these chitrali uh, hats, and um, and that was what really connected me to the Afghan issue at a very tender age. I must have been about. 15 or something at the time. And uh, my brother was volunteering for Afghan aid. He and his best friend from Eason had gone out after leaving school um, to work in satellite town in Peshawar, which uh, at the time was the capital of the northwest frontier province of Pakistan. Now it's called KPK, Kaiba Pakhtunwa. But at the time it was uh, the northwest frontier province. Of course, it was the NWFP. It was the northwesternmost point of the previous British empire. And this was where all the um, Mujahideen were basically being uh, managed and directed by the CIA, by MI6, by um, the NATO forces who who were there in in droves uh, throughout the 80s, um, sort of basically managing the war from a safe distance. Wow. Uh, I'm surprised. Now, you said your brother went there. Did you end up going there or following his footsteps or how did you end up there? So um, when I, I I initially went to, to university to study um, history of art in Italian, I mean, it, that was something that young ladies were, were supposed to do, basically go and work in an art gallery until you got plucked off the wall, like a work of art and married to some Hure Henry with a castle and a Labrador and a Range Rover. Um, but that really wasn't the future that I saw for myself. Uh, my brother, that the same brother, Hugo, was made a director of, of Sotheby's and my father too. And neither of them had a, had a deep background in, in history of art. And, um, and I was so uh, sort of uh, pissed off, I guess, that my future had, had somehow been, uh, uh, you know, mapped out by my brother and my father that I decided I would go into the city. Um, which was a very unfeminine thing to do at the time. Women were not uh, really very active in finance. Um, and and another reason that I chose to do it was because the, my brothers told me I couldn't. They said, you're a girl, you can't go into the city. So I actually did go into the city. I worked for Britain's biggest investment bank and um, did equity analysis and then equity sales very successfully. My biggest clients were the Bank of, uh, of Spain and, and the Vatican. Um, and then after three years of that, um, my soul and my heart were longing for something with more meaning, more impact. Um, and uh, also the atmosphere in the city had changed because it was after, um, well, you had, I think, Black Friday. We had Black Monday, the big stock market crash. Um, and the knives had come out in the city and people were getting fired. It's a bit like the world today in Silicon Valley, 227,000 people fired in the, the blink of an eye. Uh, well, it was the same uh, back in 87, 88 in the city. People were basically getting fired uns unceremoniously, given large paychecks, and they were going off traveling around the world. So I thought this sounded like a great idea, um, that they weren't willing to fire me. They told me I was being groomed for the top. Um, and the reason was, I think, was I was only one of three women on a dealing room floor with 500 men, so they weren't going to let me go very easily. Um, so... After a stand-up argument with my boss, who told me he was going to take all my top clients or else he would be fired, I decided that this really wasn't for me um, and that I was going to use this fight for something that I felt uh, was going to have more positive impact. So I decided to become a war journalist or an aid worker. And at the time, um, Peshawar had the highest concentration of both. So I ran up my brothers, who knew everybody on the planet, I thought at the time, and sure enough, my younger brother, Philip, who had been serving in the Grenadier Guards in, in the army in, in, uh, in Ireland, actually, at the time, said, yes, well, um, actually, you must you must go and stay with my friend Vaughan Smith. He's flying microlights that the, I think in America you used to call them ultralights, basically drones with humans hanging un underneath them. Um, and he's filming uh, Soviet enemy positions uh, from a drone, from, a, from an ultralight and then feeding the footage back to MI6 and, and, and the CIA, who were then directing operations for the Mujahideen. So, you know, he'll be out there and I'm, I'm quite sure he'll have you to stay. So I rang up Vaughan and Vaughan said, absolutely, you must totally come and stay with me. And um, of course, I was drawn partly to Peshawar in this part of the world because, um, because of the work that I'd done as a 15-year-old uh, for, the, for the ball all those years previously. Um, and... Um, 
So this uh, Vaughan Smith said to me about three weeks before I was due to fly, um, would you mind bringing a box of uh, a box out for me? Um, it contains some repairs and my, my ultralights are broken. And so I said, I'd be delighted. So a man in black turned up, a, he, a black motorbike, a black uh, all-in-one suit and a black uh, helmet and visor. And he handed me this box and he said, whatever you do, don't check it in. Take it with you. It's hand luggage. I said, okay, fine. So I turn up at the airport three weeks later with my hand luggage, go through the scanner, get on the aeroplane. There are friends of mine coincidentally on the aeroplane and I arrive at the other end and Vaughan comes to pick me up. And by the way, I'm dressed very inappropriately. I'm still dressed in my city clothes because I have no idea. It was a little bit like uh, Reese Witherspoon in Clueless, you know, all blonde and, and tight fitting padded shoulders. I still have the, the t-shirt, just sort of shiny emerald green t-shirt with padded <laughs> shoulders and a, a mini skirt basically in high heeled stilettos. And I turn up in the Hindu Kush, dressed like a sort of city girl. Um, and Vaughan comes to pick me up, looks me up and down uh, raises an eyebrow and says, okay, where's your suitcase? I hand him my suitcase. Where's the box? And I go, oops, I think I might have left it in the scanner at Heathrow. And his face drops a mile and he says, I'm really sorry, but you're on your own. And I said, why? What was in the box? And he said, microlight bolts. My microlights have broken and I'm supposed to be going in to film the siege of Jalalabad, which was one of the uh, one of the great battles that that really broke the Soviets. It was that's what got them out of Afghanistan. And he said, "I'm supposed to be providing vital intelligence um, to the military, and I can't do it anymore because you were carrying my microlight bolts." And I said, "I'm so sorry." <laughs> And he said, well, you're on your own because I'm going to now have to walk in to film the siege of Jalalabad. What would have taken me an hour will now take me three weeks, you know, basically to get there. And um, so there I was standing with my suitcase at the airport, wondering what on earth I was going to do. And that moment changed the course of both our lives. As I later discovered, I discovered only just about five years ago because Vaughan went on to set up Frontline Television News, um, which was the main agency for what they called bang bang war cameramen and then um, when television and news and everything else became so utterly dumbed down he then set up the frontline club in London which is the watering hole of, of, of all the sort of leading war correspondents and journalists and so on it's a fascinating place and I would walk in there I'm a founder member and every time I would walk in and he'd be in deep conversation with someone like Christiana Amanpour he would they would look at me he would whisper something in the person's ear and they would bo both Burst, burst out laughing. So on the fifth occasion, I went up to Vaughan and I said, Vaughan, why do you always giggle when I walk into the room? He said, oh, I'm just telling Cristiano or I'm just telling, you know, whoever, um, how, how the Frontline Club got established. It wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. I said, what are you talking about? So he said, well, unbeknownst to you, I got fired as a result of your complete idiocy that day. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't film the siege to Lalabad. I was just unceremoniously dismissed and I had to find a new way of, to survive so I used my cameraman skills and my sort of brawn to set up this war cameraman TV agency um, and uh, and out of that grew the frontline news and then the frontline club so it, it's all because of you and I said well that's interesting because my life also changed in that moment because I was unable to come and stay with you I was asked by my friends who were coincidentally on the airplane to come with them for a short walk in the Hindu Kush. And uh, I accepted because I didn't have an, a choice really. It was either that or get back on the airplane and go home. The first thing they said to me was, we're not taking you anywhere dressed like that. You're going to go into the bazaar and get yourself a shalwa kameez. And so I was trotted off into the bazaar and, and I designed my first piece, piece of clothing, which was very Lady Diana-like, puffy sleeves and, and floral and absolutely hideous. Um, but it was like a kurta, it was like pajamas, basically. It was the most comfortable thing I'd ever worn. And now you have to drag me to get me out of them. Um, but anyway, we then drove the next day for about, I think it was about 15 hours to this beautiful landlocked principality in the Hindu Kush. Um, it, or rather, it had been an independent principality until about 1969 when it ceded to Pakistan. And its name is Chitral. And it was so beautiful that it inspired Rudyard Kipling to write the book A Man Who Would Be King, which of course became the famous movie as well. 
uh, with Michael Keane. And um, and I live there and I basically, the, well, actually, I, I arrived on my 25th birthday and um, and I had a transcendental experience watching the wild polo. So this was where Britain discovered polo in the 1880s. And at the, at the time, it, it wasn't like Smith's Lawn or any of the polo matches you might find here in America. Um, it was it was wild. It was atavistic. It was without rules, and people would ride each other off. They would use their polo sticks, their mallets, and sort of bonk each other on the head. They weren't wearing mouth guards or helmets or anything. It was very wild and mesmerizing to watch. And as I was watching this match, the sun uh, came down uh, and 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 shot a beam of light through the Hindu Kush mountains, like a like a searchlight. It was dancing around on the polo field. And in the distance, the, you know, the, the mountains are 25,000 foot around, like a necklace of mountains. <clears throat> and they're very barren. They're very sheer and very, very barren. But in in the base of this valley are the it, these green, green fields shimmering in the wind, um, wheat and, and maize and other, uh, you know, agricultural products. But in the middle of it is this beautiful bluey green river snaking through and then these cypresses on either side. It, it is breathtakingly beautiful. And I had this, I called it kismat, where I had this sort of, you know, fateful moment where I felt that I'd found my spiritual home and that I was going to live here. Um, and uh, sure enough, later that day, I was um, eating birthday cake with my friends under under a tree in the mountain inn and the deputy commissioner came up apparently out of the blue, tapped me on the shoulder and said, you look like the kind of girl I need to help me set up a school. And uh, and I and I turned around and I said, why me? And he said, well, there, are, there aren't enough local educated women here and, um, you know, I, I need you to come and I need you to bring your friends and I need books and equipment. And I, I literally thought it was sent from God because it happened the same day that this beam of light had been dancing around in front of me. And so I said, okay, I'll do it. And um, so that was how I came to the Hindu Kush. I actually went back to the city. I worked until Christmas, picked up my bonus, which was something like 5,000 pounds, which was a fortune at the time. And I took the check and I went, walked into the chairman's office and I said, I'm resigning. He said, why? He said, I'm firing everybody except for you. You can't resign. I said, no, I'm resigning. He said, why? And so I said, well, I'm off to the Hindu Kush. I'm going to live on the Afghan-Pakistan border for a year. And um, he said, you're out of your mind. You should be out hunting for a husband. You should be skiing at weekends and dancing all night at Annabelle's. I said, I've been doing that for three years. I'm bored out of my mind. And I'm, I'm off for a spot of adventure. And I want to do something that has some meaning. So he said, well, I'll keep your job open for you for a year. And, but I think you're going to be back in a few months. But I have to say it was the, the happiest and the best year of my life and it changed everything for me, Jim. After that, there was no going back to a pure profit motive and, and it's really informed every life choice I've made since then. Well, it, it, it's sort of fascinating to me how when somebody who's touched by the power of being of service versus being self-focused it has such a profound effect that that's how people want to live. They realize that's how I think we were designed to live. Yes. Is that a question? No, it's a comment. But uh, in terms of question, uh, so you spent a year there, and it sounds like then, of course, you became committed to that uh, type of work in that part of the world. And so what made it continue or did you continue at the school or did you find a different project? So um, having set up the school and or having helped set up the school, because at the end of the day, it was Major Javed Majid and his wife who did the lion's share of the work. What I did was bring out uh, my friends from London, my best friend from university and my uh, uh, first cousin and others. Um, and cashed in my check and spent it on, um, I think it was 500 kilos of school books and equipment. So that was my contribution as well as teaching for a year. Um, and um, uh, once the school was up and running, um, I didn't see any need to, to carry on. Um, I had met two young 
Pakistani pop stars with Imran Khan, who went on to become the prime minister and is now languishing in jail. Um, but he introduced me to Nazia and Zuhaib Hassan, who at the time were the biggest stars in Pakistan, much bigger than Imran. Um, she very sadly died of cancer um, a, a while back, but she and I became really deep friends and her brother too. And they asked me if I would help them set up a charity called Battle Against Narcotics. Now, I was a child of the 80s and I had grown up in, in, in a London where heroin chic was all the thing. And I had a lot of personal experience of um, friends and even some uh, re re relations of mine who had fallen into heroin um, abuse and had been through rehabilitation, detox and rehab and come out the other end. Not all of them had been so lucky, but, but most of them had. And I was deeply acquainted with um, the, the concept of recovery, the 12 steps, um, and also the role of, of, of people like me, the fixers of this world, who spend their lives trying to heal and fix everyone. So I was quite well educated in, in, in those dynamics. Um, and so when I was asked to set up a battle against narcotics and asked to help draft um, Pakistan's drugs policy at the age of 25 now, um, I thought I could contribute because at the time there were three million addicts under the age of 30 in Pakistan and the government uh, refused to recognize that there was a problem. There was also a HIV, obviously there was needle sharing at the time and because there was a total lack of um, public service announcements or any kind of education and a great deal of shame about both the heroin problem and also the HIV problem, it was something that the Pakistani government had swept under the carpet until that time. So Nazir Zaheb and I got together and we I spent six months volunteering at the Pakistan Narcotic Control Board um, and drafting policy. And um, Benazir Bhutto was our patron and General Aslam Beg was our chairman, I think. Um, and we managed to persuade the army to hand over its um, hospitals for detox. And um, I got all my uh, friends to send me their priory and farm place and all of the sort of cottonwood, all of their brochures from the rehab they'd been to. And out of that, cobbled together some sort of policy document for the Pakistan government so that they could treat it in a more systematic fashion. Um, and then the powers that be got a little bit upset that this uh, English woman who had popped up in the Hindu Kush uh, as a teacher and who, by the way, had obtained um, journalist accreditation, I became the accredited Chitral correspondent for the Frontier Post because I still had aspirations at that time to to become a, a journalist. I'm not sure I ever wrote anything for them, but I had a very smart little card. <laughs> and and then here I was again popping up um, at the Pakistan Narcotic Control Board um, where there were no foreigners at all. It was just, um, well, actually the DEA, uh, the DEA were there sometimes, the CIA were there sometimes, um, but they came in for meetings and they would leave. And and I think that the powers that be, not all of whom were whiter than white, I will, will leave it at that, um, were a little concerned that um, I was sort of there. Um, so they decided to get rid of me. And in, in true Pakistani style, um, they tried to trash my reputation at a cabinet level meeting. One cabinet minister who was an old friend of mine uh, punched another cabinet minister out cold, apparently. And um, and and then the chief minister of Punjab uh, rang me up. He was a dear friend of mine too, and said, "You need to leave Pakistan within 24 hours, or you're going to be arrested, or deep, or, or that something terrible will happen to you." Um, and I had learned enough about the the ways of the world at that point to understand that that was a very serious threat and a warning. And so I literally got on the next airplane out of there, and came back to England, um, and then. Um, didn't know what to do, really. I mean, I, I was thrown um, because I felt I'd found my path in life. <clears throat> and um, I think, you know, one of the great privileges of, of my life, I always say, you know, people spend their lifetime looking for their purpose. And, and I think sometimes they feel like ships without a keel. Um, I was so blessed to be shown my purpose at the age of 25. And, and I, I, there's many things I haven't had in my life that I would have perhaps wanted, like a husband, like children, like maybe not the castle with the Range Rover and the Golden Retrievers. That was never something that I wanted, but I definitely wanted a deep uh, partnership, you know, and a, someone who I could really 
grow with and 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 I wanted to be a mother and um that hasn't happened for me I mean I I've had long relationships but I I've never got to a point where I've been able to commit in marriage to a man so <clears throat> I ha- I certainly haven't had it all um but one thing I have had is the light of um of a of a purpose from a very very young age and I'm deeply grateful for that because I know that that not having that can be very um sort of I don't know I think people who 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 have enormous material comfort but don't have purpose are not de- not desperately happy whereas I I feel I am happy I feel I've got that deep knowing I guess No I think you're right I Unfortunately, what happens to a lot of people is who chase the, if you want to call it the opposite uh, dream of material uh, things, uh, is so many people have this emptiness about them and they try to fill it with things. And unfortunately, that's part of the Western narrative, which is success uh, is equivalent to material wealth or position or power, and all it does is mask that emptiness. And oftentimes, because unfortunately, so many people admire that, that they're trying to fill that emptiness with the reality that so many people want to be like them. Yet, if uh, it's late at night, I think, that emptiness is there, and they realize on how it be, they really are. And it's really tragic because there's so many people of great wealth who could do so much to help others. And um, unfortunately, what happens, too, is that people of great wealth don't become more generous. Uh, they uh, become more selfish, frankly. And it's a very strange paradox. But uh, I think like yourself, when you're able to find your purpose early, uh, that actually becomes the most important thing because at a very deep, deep level, you are fulfilled and you don't have that uh, sense of that you're missing something. Now, that's not to say that not getting married or being in a lifelong deep relationship But at the end of the day, the most important thing that is most fulfilling is really doing something uh, of purpose and meaning and that benefits uh, others. So let me ask you a question. What did your parents think of all of this? It's a good question. (laughs) My poor mother, my poor father, my poor brothers, my God. Even to this day, my brothers are despairing of me because... Um, you know, I think they've all given up really because uh, they 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 are so, uh, I guess, deeply formed by tradition and informed by tradition. And and we come from quite a conservative background. My brother was a, a still is a member of the Conservative Party. I was a member of the Conservative Party. I ran f- for the European elections as a Conservative candidate. My brother was a, a foreign minister under uh, uh, David Cameron and is now a member of the House of Lords. So we really are very, very, uh, you can say, traditional and in some ways reactionary as a family. Um, and so um, I think my mother's very brave, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I my parents divorced when I was about 17. That was another uh, very formative experience, uh, both for me personally and, and really in the family. It changed everything. Um, and, uh, uh, we were very much, uh, I guess on our own after that, we, we became scattered in a way as a family. Um, and, um, my mother who had been brought up with immense privilege, um, taught me at that age that I needed to become independent. Um, and she did everything in her power, I think, to support that. So my father didn't want me to go to university. He was worried I would turn into what he called a blue stocking. And the blue stockings were the first suffragettes who went to University of Oxford and Cambridge back in the 1910s and 1915s of the, uh, uh, you know, over a hundred years ago now. And they, their uniform was this, these very opaque navy tights, which were considered a huge turnoff, deliberately so. 
Um, and uh, because I was showing uh, worrying signs of, of academic prowess, my father was deeply concerned and he wanted me to become, um, he wanted me to do a cookery course or a secretarial course, which is what all his Hooray Henry, Henry friends, daughters were doing. But my mother wanted me to become a diplomat um, or uh, I don't know quite what she wanted for me, but she didn't want that anyway. So, so she, she encouraged me and, and facilitated me to go to university. I'm very grateful for that. And then I went off on travel. So I had a completely wild best friend at the time and we shot off at the age of 17, she was 18, on a wild adventure that I would never allow my own daughter or nieces to do today. I mean, it was completely and utterly mad. We, we, we bought a 20-year-old Chevrolet in Albuquerque and we drove throughout uh, the Wild West and ended up in Mexico, which we'd been told not to do. We drove throughout the night in Mexico and ended up in, in, in a godforsaken town and got into terrible trouble. And I mean, it, it, these were formative ex experiences and I learned so much, but we were so young and, and anything could have happened, Jim. Um, but I guess that that, that taught me survival skills. Um, and, and my mother somehow had faith that we would be okay and, and we were. Um, and in fact, my mother came out to visit me in, in Chitral um, in, in, uh, when I was there for that year. Um, she came out and she helped to teach for a few weeks in the school. And it was a, a source of great pride to her. We took a couple of horses and we, we um, rode up to the Afghan border. And she dines out to this day on, on how she had saw these uh, border security forces training their guns on her and telling her, you know, that she had to go back to Chitral and, you know, so she loves a bit of adventure too. And I think maybe in some way she's lived, um, uh, you know, through me, and I suppose I've had freedoms that she could only ever dream of. Um, but sometimes it goes too far even for them. So uh, when my brother was made a foreign minister, um, I was told I had a target on my back. I won't say by which government, but uh, I, as usual, I'd, I'd uh, been uh, sort of upsetting somebody with my efforts to stem corruption and um, promote stability in an otherwise deeply unstable region. And um, so my brother said to me, uh, you're grounded, you know. By the way, <laughs> I was grounded at the in my mid-40s, not in my, yeah. I wasn't 14, but I was grounded anyway. So he said, you're not going back to Afghanistan. And I was due to fly back the following day. I was under contract at the time to the World Bank um, and finalizing a contract to uh, build the gems and jewelry sector of Afghanistan. And I was, uh, I'd been helping to rewrite the artisanal mining policy of Afghanistan um, and uh, help uh, train the jewelers and gem cutters uh, to reach international standards and help them build global markets for their products. And um, you can imagine that there were a lot of individuals and entities with vested interests in the value chain um, and I was trying to formalize all of it and, and make it all tickety-boo so that we could market a sustainable and ethical product. Um, so, um, yeah, so my brother told me that, that my mother was suffering greatly and she was now in her early 80s and, and I was somehow responsible for her anxiety. And, and, and he told me that now that he was a foreign minister, if I was kidnapped, it would cause an international incident and, and there was nothing he could do. Uh, to get me back, and I didn't fancy myself in an orange boiler suit um, on a on a sort of death video with ISIS and or you know Al Qaeda as it was then, and so I I demurred and um, ended up not going back. So that must have been uh, phew, must have been end of 2015, 16, and I haven't been back since. So I do occasionally wow. listen to my family. <laughs> this <laughs> now uh, was this before or after? Were you um, brought pashminas to the world? Pashminas, yes, I'm wearing one today. So, um, well, you can imagine that living in the Hindu Kush, um, in order to, to respect the local culture, we had to wear the local clothes. So as a woman, that meant wearing a shawl like this on my head in public, which I used to do. Um, and it became, it became like a uniform for us. And then at that same event, the fundraiser uh, that Imran Khan was hosting for his mother's cancer hospital, where I met Nazia and Zoheb Hassan, I also met some of India's leading movie stars at the time, Kabir Bedi, who had been the bad, baddie in Octopussy, and Rekha, who was the biggest uh, female movie star of her generation, 
and others of that league were there. And they were all wearing these pashminas, um, this this color actually, this rather beautiful uh, earthy tone, natural color. And um, I went up and I felt them and I, and I said, oh my God, what is that? I've never felt anything so fine. And they said, oh, these are pashminas. Uh, we can get them for you. They're just $2,000. Uh, how many would you like? <laughs> it was like... I was on a volunteer, you know, wage or salary. I think we were earning $20 a month or something at the time. So I thought, no, no, that's a little out of my league. Um, thank you so much, but no, thank you. And then um, later that year, I was invited to a wedding in Kathmandu. Uh, some members of the, Af of the Nepalese royal family had invited me to Kathmandu uh, for this wedding. And um, my hostess, uh, Rajni, and her sister Renu um, said, well, listen, they're not $2,000. They're made by the workshop up the road. We'll take you there tomorrow. And so I went up to this little workshop in the Himalayas um, in the, on the outskirts of Kathmandu. And there was this um, businessman, I, if I recall rightly, I think he was an Indian um, silk trader. And he had excess silk that he had been unable to sell and he w was wondering what he should do with it. So he took local, locally available cashmere and he took the ends of his silk bolts and he wove them together in what became um, the famous pashmina sh shawl, which was a mix of silk and cashmere. And um, I can't remember how much they were, maybe $200 at the time. They certainly weren't 2000 So I packed a suitcase and filled with them. I think there were four or five colors. There was this neutral color. There was, I think, red, black, white. Um, and I brought them back to England and I gave them to my girlfriends because they were stunning. And my girlfriends went, oh my God, we've never felt anything like this. You know, can I have one in pink and yellow and gray? And I'm going to this wedding and I've got Ascot and whatever. Can you do them in these colors? So the next time I went out to Kathmandu, because I was back and forth, I forgot to mention, I got recruited into the BBC World Service Radio and then television to start doing news pieces um, as a way to sort of keep the wolf from the door and keep me keep me on the road with my adventurous life. And so um, I would go back and film, you know, uh, maybe elephant polo in the jungles of the southern Nepal. And I would, while I was there, I'd pack my suitcases filled with pashminas. And then one day I get a call out of the blue from Lucinda Chambers, who was at the time the director of British Vogue. And she said, um, I've seen your beautiful pashminas on all your beautiful girlfriends. Um, and I'm doing a fashion shoot with Christy Turlington and Kate Moss in Kathmandu. No one at Bush House, which is the headquarters of, uh, not Bush House, Vogue House, Vogue House in Hanover Square. No one at uh, Vogue House has a, has a clue about Nepal. And I understand you're something of an expert. Would you mind coming in and debriefing me, giving me some ideas for locations? And while you're at it, could you bring your beautiful shawls? So I, I said, sure, absolutely no problem. And um, because I'm I'm a little savvy, I thought, well, okay, Kathmandu, Christy Turlington, Kate Moss. Um, this was a this was the time of Romeo Gigli, where where the, the the fashionable colors that were you know the Buddhist colors, the color that you're wearing today is that sort of ochery, uh, deep deep burgundy um, Buddhist red and. Um, these natural tones and um, saffron and, uh, um, you know, Buddhist maroon, as I came to call it, all these colors. So I took uh, some white pashminas and I went off and I got them dyed up in all the shades of, of, of Buddhism. And I took them into Vogue House the following week and she opened the, um, the suitcase and she died and went to heaven. She went, oh my God, these are perfect. She said, can I use them on, on, on uh, can I use this on Christy Turlington? And I said, of course you can. So then she looked around for a label and she saw that there wasn't a label. And she said, well, you know, what brand do you sell them under? I said, I said, no, I don't sell them. I, I give them to my girlfriends. And, he, and she said, well, I, um, I can't very well publish your home telephone number um, in Vogue. You know, you're going to have thousands of, of queries. Um, you know, would you be interested in in selling them? I said, well, I don't know. I don't see why not. Um, so she she rang up there and then. She rang up the buyer of Brands, which was the biggest style maker in Britain at the time. The buyer of Brands, her name was Francois Tessier, and everyone was terrified of Francois Tessier. She was a, a bit like Britain's Anna Winter. You know, she was frosty and unapproachable. <laughs> and because she got a call from Lucinda Chambers, she agreed to see me. 
And Lucinda then called the buyer at Harris and the same conversation took place. And I dragged my suitcase because this was before the, the era of wheelies. I dragged my suitcase from, from Hanover Square to South Moulton Street, which wasn't very far. And Francois opened the suitcase and plunged a hand into this deliciously soft um, pile of pashminas and went, Oh, but these are beautiful. I will try some for a couple of days and we shall see. And um, then I trotted off to Harris and had the same conversation and she took some on sale or return. And they both rang me up the next day and said, we have sold out. This is going to work very well. Uh, you know, when can we have some more? <laughs> and um, so then I, so then they said, but you need a label. Um, and so I had no idea about fashion. I mean, I was a, I was a entrepreneur and a, and a, a teacher and a banker and, I had no idea about fashion. Um, my mother, by contrast, was was the height of chic. You know, she she wore all the top designers, and she used to call me the fifteen year old peasant. Um, and she she was tall and slim and and utterly elegant, and and always in the hairdresser and everything. And and um, I was this slightly sort of wild, um, sort of proto hippie type in a way, um, and uh, not interested in designer clothes at all. Um, but anyway, so I, I rifled through her wardrobe and Gucci, Pucci, Yves Saint Laurent, you know, I didn't like any of the labels. And then I came across Sonia Recal Paris and that looked nice and clean. So I got the scissors and I snipped it out. I hope she wasn't going to notice. And I ship, shipped this Sonia Recal Paris up to a designer um, who I'd met and said, instead of Sonia Recal Paris, can you make it Sophia Soir London? because I thought it would be helpful for people to know who to call if they wanted a pashmina. I had no idea what I was about to launch, none whatsoever. <clears throat> and a few weeks later, back came this exquisite little, you know, boxes and boxes of, of satin labels, like perfect. And I had to learn to sew for the first time. I'd never sewn on a button in my life. And so somewhere there's a photo of me and my girlfriends on a sofa, sewing on the first labels, and someone said, "This is this, you know, this will this will be a, one day. This will be history." And sure enough, um, you know, wherever I I travelled, uh, which was quite a lot, even at the time, I would drag my suitcase and I would go to the local top magazine, the local Vogue, the local um, Harper's Bazaar, or whatever it was, and I would say, um, you know, these are the most incredible new product. It's it's coming out in Vogue, or it's come out in Vogue here or there. It's in the top taste, uh, style making cool stores in London, um, you know, uh, would you like to have them? And by that time I'd printed them in every shade and every size. So I would leave a bag of, of goodies behind in, in at, at, at the Vogue's and the Papa's bazaars and all over the world. And, and the fashion editors never said no, because they always had something they could pull at the last minute to go in a fashion shoot. And then I would take the, the suitcase off to the local top um, stores and say, well, listen, Vogue is going to use this um, in the next couple of weeks and, and I don't have a local store to credit. Can I credit Calypso? Can I credit um, Neiman Marcus? Can I credit whoever? And no one ever said no. So so that way I sort of, I hacked, I hacked the the, the fashion trade, you could say. And, um, you know, a while later I had a, I had a, mu a million dollar business um, and running it off my laptop and at the same time producing uh, documentaries on the side for the BBC and Channel 4. And I have yet to mention, um, the establishment of that first school led to the establishment of my first not-for-profit, or maybe second if you include a Battle Against Narcotics, but um, I set up a charity called Learning for Life with, with a dear friend of mine, um, Charlotte Bannister, the daughter of Roger, Sir Roger Bannister, the man who ran the first four-minute mile. Uh, so she was super, super bright um, and with a deep spiritual side to her. She's just finished her PhD in comparative religion and spiritual ecology, actually. Um, wow. Yeah, she, I'm hoping she's going to turn that into a book. Um, and so we're still sort of deeply aligned in our life's mission. Um, and so through Learning for Life, we raised funds through different means, um, partly through sales of my pashmina, but also uh, raising money from the British government and what was known then at the Overseas Development Agency and Comic Relief and others events. And we uh, managed to establish uh, more than 200 schools in the region. I, I think it was around 250, if you include all the Tibetan orphanage schools that we funded through Sami Ling. Uh, Jim, you may, you may remember Sami Ling, Ak Akong Rinpoche, 
So I was very drawn to Tibetan Buddhism as well um, at a very early age and, and was very happy to be supporting those schools. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I was doing all of that as well in parallel and everything grew and grew and grew. And then, then at the end of the 90s, I had to, to, to choose because each one of those was a full-time job. And um, and so I, I decided that since my knight in shining armor hadn't turned up, I was still waiting for him, um, still waiting for him, actually. Um, so all of our listeners, there's an opportunity here. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> You're turning red. <laughs> well... Yeah, my mother got remarried um, age 69, so I'm fully hopeful that my dream man will will, will manifest and, and be available as well. I, I should point out, you're not anywhere close to 69. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> of course. Well, so uh, I'll change the subject so you'll stop uh, being red. Uh, so tell me then, how did you get to where you're at today? Because I know that you're focused on the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, in fact, uh, you're raising a venture fund uh, to support uh, women, and which is run by women. And there's a significant uh, goal to uh, educate women in these parts of the world. That's right. So, so that first experience um, in my 25th year taught me the transformative power of education um, as a deep change maker, not just for the women and girls who were educated, not even just for their immediate families or even for their villages, but for the entire community. So, so when I went back to Chitral a few decades later, I found that it was a flourishing economy that infant and maternal mortality had had dropped. When I arrived, um, the literacy rate for women was something like 2%, 2.5%, and uh, now it's about 40%, which is in line with the uh, the national average. The, the region had one of the highest maternal and infant mortality rates in the world, and now it's in line with Pakistani uh, national averages, which is which is too high, but it's nothing like what it was. And this is because we educated the girls to aspire to become doctors and teachers and nurses to become professionals. Uh, and the boys as well. I mean, it was at, at the time it was mixed. Um, they've now separated the boys and the girls, uh, you know, the adult children or the, the sort of teenage children are, are streamed in according to gender. Um, but these, are, these were children of, of floor sweeps and drivers. And um, it was a big mix, actually. But, but these children went on to become um, engineers and architects and, and they really brought the entire valley up by the bootstrap. So really that was what informed my passion for education um, and, and for girls, really. I mean, even at the time there were UN reports coming out talking about how if you keep a girl in school for a couple of years longer, um, it, 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 it results in social indicators uh, that impact positively impact the quality of life for the whole family, that strengthen democracy, that massively reduce the population growth rate, etc. It really is a silver bullet if you if you need one. Um, so I've I've had a deep commitment for education and and empowerment of girls uh, because I think it affects so many other things that that uh, is of great concern concern to the world. One of which, of course, is is um, the population emergency in in countries in Africa. Um, and and in still now in Pakistan, um, so I mentioned earlier that that I'd been grounded um, and um, and I was wondering what to do to do next. And around that time, I was asked to speak at various conferences um, on empowering women in in conflict zones and what happens when you back women, not just men. Um, and girls started reaching out to me, young women, founders started reaching out to me across various social media channels. We're talking 2015 at this point, and 2014, 2015, and basically asking me if I would join their boards, if I would assist them with introductions to investors, if I would myself invest and so on. And this was, it became a bit of a tsunami, which gathered pace in 2018, the year of the Me Too movement. Um, and and I, I was wondering why they had identified me as, as their champion. 
And so I, I asked them, um, you know, why why couldn't they raise money from friends and family? Why couldn't they raise money from from venture capitalists? And they told me about the biases that they had experienced. Um, in some cases, they had had large six figure checks dangled in front of them, and uh, they were asked what they were doing for the weekend or what were, were they free for dinner. Um, and I was I was amazed uh, really to find out that in the 21st century that this was still happening. Um, and then when the Me Too movement broke and a lot of attention was put on these kinds of um, abuses, a lot of reports concurrently were coming out by uh, written by the Boston Consulting Group, by Ernst & Young, by Price, uh, Price Waterhouse, Coopers and McKinsey, etc., looking at um, access to finance for, for women and looking at the drivers of, behind these biases, conscious and otherwise. And I was amazed to learn. At the time, I think it was around two and a half percent or three percent of global private equity funding was going to all female teams. Um, and uh, I think it was maybe 10 percent or 13 percent was going to mixed founder teams. And about 80 percent or more was going to male only founder teams. And by the way, white male only founder teams, You not, not really any you know, Latinos, not right. African Americans, at least in the States. I was flabbergasted. I was astounded. Um, and so I thought, well, okay, this is my next big thing. This is an area where I can bring to bear um, a lifetime of experience, both as, as a, as a, you know, I started out, out obviously doing equity analysis and equity sales. So I had a deep foundation in finance. I'd been a serial founder myself. Uh, I'd worked in fashion and brand building and, and education and communications and politics. And, you know, I'd had a very, I guess, eclectic um, upbringing and, and, and work experience. And I thought I can bring all of that to bear to have impact in this area. Um, and then, um, so I decided to, to start to build um, a network, which is how, um, as women, we, we tend to work in collaboration. It's one of the feminine ways of doing things slightly differently. So um, I built a network of, of movers and shakers um, that was a combination of people that I'd met in Silicon Valley, um, some of the leading investors in Silicon Valley, some of the leading technicians and experts in quantum, now quantum um, computing and AI and blockchain and and um, some of the founders of, you know, the Han Academy, for instance, EdTech and HealthTech and all these things. And um, my initial idea was to launch a transatlantic fund because I was trying to get myself out of the war zones and out of the conflict zones, partly to keep my family happy. Um, and also you can imagine that after years of, of uh, living and working in Afghanistan, I forgot to mention, I actually lived in Afghanistan for, for several years and experienced some some of the um, sort of traumas of being surrounded by um, bombs going off and, and attacks and so on and friends getting kidnapped and in one case, um, sadly killed. Um, so I, I wanted to have a life that was grounded in, in some sort of more stable um, country environment. Um, and so I started looking at, at raising a transatlantic fund and we built a pipeline of more than 600 outstanding women founders who were seeking finance and uh, through this network started trying to link them to investors. Um, and we were about to launch when COVID hit. Now, um, COVID, this was, I guess, February 2020, February, March 2020. Um, and I, I spoke to some of the funders that we had been, um, I'd been sort of initially reaching out to, and they said, listen, we're going to be double, double, doubling down on our existing investments because we expect that COVID will impact uh, companies and also funds negatively. And we need to meet our, um, we need to meet general partners for the first time in person, at least two or three times before we'll write a check. So it's not the time, just sort of hold off. So everyone thought, you'll remember, Jim, everyone thought that COVID was going to last a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, not a couple of years. Um, but in the event, it lasted a couple of years. And then I came up for air um, in 2021, August, 20, July 2021. And I was due to launch the fund in September. And in fact, I, I'd been asked to speak at the G20 on, on the main stage at the G20 and on the main stage at the COP26 in Glasgow to announce a commitment to raise and deploy 100 million dollars in female founders when boom, Afghanistan fell. So um, I mean I, I I had a suspicion that it would it would fall, but perhaps not with the speed that it fell. 
and and certainly not with the desperation with which it fell and the abandonment that that, that went with it. I mean, I think what what our respective governments did um, and how badly it was bungled at the time is unforgivable. Uh, so I started receiving calls from girls whom we had educated and skilled in, in gem cutting and jewellery and other digital literacy and so on, begging me for their lives. And so I turned to the, to the, to the fund's network. By the way, the fund is called JEDI, Gender Equity Diversity Investments, JEDI, a soft G. And, um, and I, I, I said to the JEDI network, I said, which of you would like to have immediate impact uh, helping rescue Afghan girls and women? And two thirds of them put their hand up. So we set up the Jedi uh, VC uh, network for or task force for future brilliance, which is the second, third nonprofit I set up um, in Afghanistan. And collaboratively, we raised um, about half a million dollars in a couple of weeks. And um, with our trustees, um, we contracted a an airplane and moved, assisted uh, about 425 Afghans to move through um, Taliban checkpoints and hid them in safe houses in Mazar Sharif in the north of Afghanistan. And then the two years of, of drama and adventure followed. And again, we thought it would be seven weeks. I thought this is just seven weeks of my life. I can delay the launch of the fund. Um, but in fact, it was two, another two years. So two years went to COVID and two years went to rescuing Afghans. And when I came up for air again, which is now basically, um, having pulled out um, hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, highly targeted Afghan families and found them asylum across the world, um, we've secured asylum for 95% of the people we had under our roof um, and in our care. Um, so the world is very different, obviously. The, the you know Inflation is driving something resembling recession by any other name. Um, and uh, first-time funds in the, in the first world are not getting funded very easily. Uh, again, uh, you know, people are not writing checks, at least not here so much. In Silicon Valley, you have enormous unemployment um, and it's a really tough environment. But because I'd been focused on Pakistan and Afghanistan for the last two years, uh, we were running safe houses in Pakistan um, and I'd been spending a great deal of time in the Middle East trying to raise funds for and negotiate with um, the Emiratis and the Saudis for assistance with the Afghans. I built deep relationships in the region, and um, with with funders and investors and uh, and others. And I I witnessed with amazement this Arab female renaissance that's underway that Western media hasn't really woken up to yet. So um, I I've been blown away by the power and the strength of the Arab women that I've met um, while I've been spending time in in Saudi Arabia in Abu Dhabi, in Dubai, and more recently in, in Casablanca and Marrakesh in Morocco and elsewhere in North Africa, um, that these powerful, powerful Arab women who are experiencing their own Arab Spring right now, um, more than 50% of university graduates are women in the region. A chunk of those are studying the STEM subjects, something like 40% of, 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 um, of uh, students studying STEM are women. That's higher than the rates, I believe, in the US and in the UK at least. Um, and an, a, a increasing numbers of them are going to tertiary education. Quite a few of them are coming to Stanford and Yale um, and uh, Berkeley and Oxford and Cambridge, uh, other first class universities and returning, brimming with ideas, filled with knowledge of cutting edge technologies and a desire to set up their own companies, and yet only 1.3% of venture capital funding for women in the re for, for, for people in the region is going to women, female founders. Now, um, you'd have thought that after the Me Too movement, the, the global average might have righted itself, but actually the, the reverse happened. So, so men in Silicon Valley, the, the, the chaps who have the still unfortunately the, 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 the check writing power, uh, no longer wanted to mentor female founders. They didn't want to be alone in an office with them. Without the door open, it became stressful um, and uh, difficult for everybody. So they basically dropped them. And the result was that um, that funding went from, I think, an all-time high of something like about, I think it was about 3.2%. It's now back down to 1.9% globally. And I believe in the US it's 2.1%. So, uh, but in, in 
In the Middle East, it's only 1.3%. Um, and, and that's in spite of the fact that there's so much talent. In, in Saudi Arabia now, 44% of startups have at least one female founder. So you can see that there's a, a huge disconnect between talent, opportunity, and the money that's required to, to invest in and scale these opportunities. And the, the irony is that female founders, if once they are venture-backed, are more profitable, they're more sustainable. Women generally are drawn to more sustainable um, com uh, type of uh, interventions in, uh, you know, that were very, very drawn to interventions in health and, and education and also um, energy transition solutions and um, anything that's going to make the world a better, healthier, happier place. Um, there are more women involved in those kinds of companies and industries than there are men. Um, and uh, these women deserve to be backed. But also, if you're looking to, um, you know, make more money, female-led businesses and diverse-led businesses, they return more on capital, significantly more on capital, and they exit faster. So, um, in other words, they're sold faster. They might they might exit to IPO. They might be sold to another corporation. But last year, I think, was the twelfth successive year that female founders, um, companies exited faster than their male counterparts. So it doesn't make any sense to, to me at all, you know, with my investment banking hat on or my equity hat on from, from decades ago, there's a huge opportunity here to back female talent. And, and it's time that the West woke up to the, to the understanding that Arab women, Muslim women are not victims. They're incredibly powerful. They're incredibly bright. They're very well educated. Obviously, the women in Afghanistan are are victims, and uh, there are huge exceptions uh, to this rule. But once they are educated and free to do what they want to do, there's nothing more powerful than a an Arab uh, educated Arab woman with with uh, with an idea that she wants to to see come to fruition. And Jedi wants to get behind these women and um, enable them to grow tech solutions that will enable them to um, keep their countries habitable for longer because uh, countries like Morocco are suffering from an extreme water stress. Uh, the biggest problem for it facing Morocco at the moment is water security, followed by food security. Um, ditto Egypt, Algeria, Tunisia. Um, obviously, these countries plus Jordan are in the front line and Turkey are in the front line of the refugee crisis. At the moment, the majority of refugees are conflict-related refugees. Um, you might argue that the Syrian conflict was actually driven by water wars, so that was perhaps the first climate-related war. And a lot of the um, the majority of the refugees in Jordan are Syrian. Um, but, but the UN and the IET and other bodies are now predicting hundreds of millions of climate-related uh, displacement over the next 10, 20 years. It's already happening. I was speaking to a very prominent um, Moroccan tech founder in Palo Alto last week, who was telling me that in Rabat, there are already favelas. <clears throat> there are already these slums that are popping up where uh, people who are being displaced by extreme weather events from sub-Saharan Africa are finding themselves without support, without um, access to food or education or, or health or, or shelter. Um, and this what we're seeing now is a, is a trickle compared to the tsunami that's going to happen as parts of these countries become uninhabitable, as temperatures surge above 50 degrees centigrade to 55, as we've seen this year and beyond. Um, and I think that, you know, countries in the southern Mediterranean, Turkey, uh, um, Greece, uh, Italy, Spain, these countries are in the front line of the tsunami of um, climate refugees. And, and these countries are not tremendously stable already. They're already suffering from natural resource uh, pressure. Um, and if they have um, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people who will be forcibly displaced, trying to shift into, um, into Spain, Italy, Greece, and upwards to France, Germany, and Britain, which is we know their path, um, though, that, that is those who are not trying to come to America because there's plenty of people getting on boats and trying to come to Haiti and Brazil and, and then pushing up through the Darien Gap into Mexico and then beyond. 
I think this this problem is not just a, a, a European problem. It'll be a, an American, a North American problem too. Um, that that I, I just believe that not enough is being done from a policy perspective, from a government perspective, but also from an investment perspective to enable these countries to remain habitable for longer and to prepare for the inevitable uh, reality of vast quantities of people who will be displaced and on the move. Let, let me ask you, uh, we're running out of time, and I just wanted to, in terms of the work that you're doing, if somebody wants to connect uh, or support the work you're doing, how would they connect with you? Well, um, I think uh, obviously online is is the best. We we have uh, the the fund, the future fund. It, it's a fund in formation. I should add, it's not yet registered or regulated. It's it's about to be. It does have a foundation arm. So if people are of a mind to donate or have a family trust or foundation, and and they would like to give to a five hundred one c three. There's a Jedi Foundation, and if they go to the website, they can find the details. And and what is that website? Could you just repeat it for us? It's www.jedi.vc, so that's G-E-D-I dot V-C. So at this stage, they can donate. In the near future, they'll be able to potentially become um, investors in the fund. The fund is, is planning to, uh, a minimum of a 3x return. So it's a standard venture capital return. It's not concessionary capital and it's not a charity in itself. Although the mission, it's very, very mission driven. Um, if, if people feel moved to support women in Afghanistan, we have a separate 501c3. That is Future Brilliance. And we have a, a, a website which is www.futurebrilliance, B-R-I-L-L-I-A-N-C-E dot org, futurebrilliance.org. And there you can give through, a, uh, there's a button there you can give directly or through our GoFundMe campaign. Um, and we do have still women who are in transit who are seeking to get flights for and accommodation for and shelter for, etc. While we, um, I think we have 5% of, of our people have, are yet to go to countries like Australia and so on. So support is invited and, and we also want to help educate women in Afghanistan remotely through digital literacy uh, training initiatives inside Afghanistan. So there's an opportunity to help um, Afghan women through Future Brilliance. There's an opportunity to help um, to stabilize the, these North African countries to empower Arab female founders and to prepare the world for the inevitable um, uh, hum humanitarian tragedy, um, but also security uh, threat of hundreds of millions of people on the move and these people will need products and services and the, the companies that are establishing locally adapted solutions for trauma, counseling, mental health and well-being, online health, online education, access to um, banking online and, and also to, to the gig economy, to jobs online so that these communities, these people can become self-sufficient and perhaps less of a burden to their host countries. All of these things can be um, solved partly through private sector investment and and Jedi is the vehicle for that and and I welcome and invite everyone to become a Jedi. Well Sophia, thanks so much for being with us. I'm sure you and I could just go on for a number of hours. I think this issue of climate refugees uh, is an ever enlarging problem and must be addressed. And thank you for all the incredible work and passion you have for this and uh, I have no doubt that this uh, project will get funded, and uh, I look uh, forward to our continued uh, interaction. So thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. Again, thank you for being with us today. The Into the Magic Shop podcast can be found where you find your most popular podcasts, or you can find us at intothemagicshop.com.